it's you know one of those red flags that just uh, raises the hair on the back of your neck and so you know even back then for for travelers and and people in the field it was just it was obvious like yes we're triggering these on the flats and it propagates and then releases a slope and and so when you would look at the theories and they all required a slope to to propagate the fracture um it was like well, well you know what's going on and so let's take a look at it Given my experience patrolling, avalanche forecasting, and being in the backcountry triggering wumps, obviously there was a very much of an underemphasis of remote triggering from flat terrain. Um, and I thought, boy, there's just really got to be uh, more going on here. I think the motivation behind the actual experiment was just that it had been described, um, you know, in the literature, you could find instances where people had described wumps and estimated speeds. Um, there was a Truman uh, short one pager from the 70s um, where he was up in New England, I think somewhere in the Northeast, and he talked about sort of this new phenomenon, snow waves and snow, and estimated a speed of six meters per second. And then um, a few Antarctic researchers had covered these and described fern quakes which I think are just wumps at a larger scale down there. And so it was just interesting that here the speeds had been estimated 30 years ago, um, talked about in the literature, um, was physical, um, but nobody had measured it. And so I think, I think that was really the, the driving, sort of the, nobody had done it, so let's give it a try. It, see, the speed seemed important because it, very, it could potentially vary so much, six meters per second, um, up to the speed of sound. And so, you know, the sort of question was, well, why does it vary? Um, the other motivation was at the time, as I recall, the avalanche initiation theories broke down on flat slopes. And so there wasn't really a good explanation <clears throat> of how you could trigger an avalanche from a flat slope. So the, me the method was, um, geophones, we had a string of six that were donated, and then a seismograph, and it was an old heat trace seismograph, and so you press the button, um, I, I think it ran on like large D batteries, you know, it was, it was huge, it was the size of a, like a suitcase, um, couldn't take a carry on, bigger than that. So you press the button, and you had 10 seconds, and I, re I read the, my thesis again, and I, re I remember these 10 seconds, you had 10 seconds where it would print, and then it would stop. So measuring things in the field and getting real values that had never been done before. So um, sometime in the middle of winter, Parks Canada got a hold of our group and said, hey, wumps are on. So we all mobilized to Lake Louise. Um, we went north each day to the Bow Summit area, just south of there, walking through flat meadows trying to get wumps. And we, with my 1986 Toyota toaster van and Bruce's old CRV, uh, Honda CRV, and um, I was pretty much living in my van at that point. Um, I had a couple of speakers that were, you know, removable. They weren't wireless in that day, but you could put them on top of your car. And so Tom Chalmers pulled those speakers out on top of the car, and, and he started blasting Jimmy Cliff. So we were out there, um, you know, setting up for this experiment, walking around, listening to Jimmy Cliff and Banff National Park near Bow Summit. And so, you know, you had to sort of try to initiate the warmth 10 seconds and then everybody would stop and, and stay still. And so, so the general method was get these out on a disturbed meadow, hit the recorder, trigger a warmth within the 10 seconds. And then, and then, you know, a lot of it included getting lucky. Um, looking back, I th we were out there for three days and it, we had nine attempts. So, you know, eight of these, we probably tiptoed around a meadow. Uh, we figured out that the easiest way not to trigger a wump was to, was to post hole. And so it was just post hole around this meadow, get, get people on either side, toss a rope, pull the geophones through. So we did that. Um, there was a, you know, there was a, um, this, again, this very nice meadow and uh, the, 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 um, the string of geophones went out across the meadow, post holing away, didn't trigger the wump, got the data logger set up. I grabbed Bruce's camera, climbed up this tree, I don't know, 20, 25, 30 feet in the tree. So Crane started the geophone recorder while Greg and I were motionless. Tom walked into the meadow on snowshoes. Then we all felt and heard the wump. 
There was silence while Crane focused on the recorder. When he called out, we got it, we got it, we all whooped and cheered like the Ghostbusters when they got their first call. We had six geophones. Uh, the, the, the warmth propagated through the first four, and then we did have one defective geophone that didn't pick it up. And so um, we captured the signal at three geophones. And looking back at the old trace, um, it was right around seven seconds. And, and then after that, you know, we sort of shut down the experiment and it was time to sort of collect the data, describe the slab, um, follow up with all the parameters we could measure um, beyond just the speed. I know at the time when we captured it, I think we all realized right away, you know, we had success. I remember we all went out for dinner that night and celebrated. Uh, it was a sense of relief for me. And so I was, I know day two, day three, I was trying to get, starting to get worried about uh, coming back empty handed. So um, for me, it was just, uh, yeah, a sense of relief that we, it paid off. When Crane submitted his paper with a measured wave speed of 20 meters per second, it was rejected based on review, which found it not believable. A year and a half later, we tweaked parts of the paper and resubmitted. This time, the reviews were positive and the paper was published. Apparently, the reviewers of the revised paper found the speed measurement to be credible. When I first learned about these measurements that Crane and Bruce's group had done on the warmth speed, I was really excited. I thought that it was really a logical extension of some of the work that Bradley had done before. And also crack speed was so interesting because it started to give us a window into what potential mechanism was driving crack propagation. The real key aspect of this work is that the measured crack speed was much slower than was predicted by the pure shear model and was more in line with models of weak layer collapse driving the propagation process. And this led to a different paradigm for how we think about avalanche release. Also, it really raised the awareness that crack speed measurements are very important. Accurate crack speed measurements can help provide a window into the mechanisms behind propagation. These crack measurements caught the eye of Joachim Heyerly, and he developed and formalized the anti-crack model for crack propagation in snow. The anti-crack model, for example, predicted that the ease of triggering should be similar at different slope angles. And that got myself and some other colleagues looking at how easy it was to trigger extended column tests and compression tests at different slope angles. And we found that our results were consistent with the predictions of the anti-crack model. We found that you could get very good stability test results in gentler terrain. And that was a very important finding for backcountry avalanche forecasters who no longer had to travel into avalanche starting zones to collect data necessarily representative of the current conditions. And so there's been this real back and forth that's happened ever since uh, the publication of that paper about 20 years ago and this back and forth um, cooperation between field researchers and modelers have re has really driven the science of avalanche release forward over these last two decades. In some ways, this work was a turning point in our understanding of avalanche release. Charles Bradley had investigated collapses, but this was the first time we had a rock solid measurement of the speed of a propagating crack in the snowpack. And these turning points in science really can only be identified in, in hindsight. But looking back, it sure feels like it was a turning point to me.